It's good to see you. We're so honored to get to share the Word of God with you every weekend. And uh, we also want to welcome all of our other campuses, Baxter, Sparta, Livingston. It's good to be with you guys. The reports that you guys had for VBS is just amazing. So thank you for all your dedication and, and love for all the kids. You're just, you're just killing it, and we appreciate you. Uh, no matter where you're tuning in from, thank you for coming and studying the Word of God with us. It's an honor as well to bring you the Word. And uh, we want to give a special welcome to all of our family in the correctional facilities. Can we welcome them to church? <laughs> Amen. Let me, let me cover a couple things real quick before we get into the Word. First of all, I know some of you see this construction, and you may not care, but I always like to over-communicate and explain ourselves what's going on. Uh, we're doing some construction over the next few weeks because we've got to change out this back screen. And uh, may not look like it because still has a pretty good picture. That's been here since we moved in here in 2007. It works well except for the other campuses. Um, what happens is this is so old, the pixels are so big, so when the camera, because they watch me on video, they get to see HD and HD, hot daddy and high definition. Uh, <laughs> but what happens is the cameras try to zoom in on that and it'll start doing this and people actually get sick and have to leave the auditorium. And so we're hoping that'll fix that because if it doesn't fix it, then it must be my preaching making you sick. And I don't know what to tell you except wait on Pastor Eddie. But, uh, but we're going to be changing these screens out so it'll bring a better uh, um, uh, feel for our other campuses. So I want to explain that to you. And then the second thing I want to tell you is I literally cannot hear this morning out of my left ear. Why do I tell you that? Because all I can hear in my head is my voice, which now I know how you feel. <laughs> but I told my wife this morning, I said, Jen, my ears stopped up. I, I can't even hear out of the left side of my ear. So she put drops in it. That made it worse. Now I definitely can't hear. So if this message stinks, it's Jen's fault. I, I was trying to obey God. So anyway, Lord, speak to us. Teach us today. Would you open our eyes, our ears, our hearts? May we believe and receive what you have for us today so that, Lord, we can become more and more like you. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So my title this morning is In Transit. In Transit. And here's, here's where I felt like the Lord wanted us to go with this. So uh, I know every one of you either have or are in the midst of right now, believe in God for something. Uh, you're praying about something. You're asking God to move in a situation or bring something into your life. And we should, because the Bible says we have not because we ask not. So God wants us to come to him in prayer. But here's what I'm getting at. But often we've been praying about something, believe in God for something, but it just isn't showing up. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And what can start happening is, is we can start questioning God or even questioning ourselves. Does God not want to listen to me? Does God not hear me? Does prayer even work? We've had those thoughts, right? I want to talk to you about that. Before I do get into the scriptures, I want to use an illustration here. Anybody ever order anything from Amazon? If you don't know how to do that, get with my wife, Jennifer. She'll tell you. I mean, she's got it down pat, baby. Me and the UPS guy are like high five. <laughs> yeah, hey, Tom, how you doing? How's the kids doing? Anyway, she's got that thing figured out. Well, every once in a while, I'll order from Amazon. And here's what I noticed about ordering from Amazon. When you go on there and you find out whatever item it is you want, and you click on it, move it to the cart, and then you pay for it. Now, here's, the th here's what I'm getting at. So the moment I click on that and I give them my credit card and it's paid for, it's mine. Why? I paid for it. The problem is it's in transit. I want you to understand something. On the cross, Jesus Christ paid for not just your salvation someday in heaven, but your life here on the earth. Everything you need, listen to me, even that thing you've been praying for, he's already paid for it. Here's how I know that. Because see, sometimes we just make salvation about the sweet by and by in heaven. No, no, no. The Bible says when you and I got born again, that we were in Christ, given everything that pertains to life and godliness. So the life to come, but the, now, the life that now is. What do I mean by given everything? Uh, if you need peace, if you need joy, 
If you need deliverance, if you need healing, if you need relationships mended, the Bi- that's biblical, and we should go to God for that. And the Bible says he's already paid for it. So it says he's given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. And then the apostle Paul says, in Christ, you have been, not going to be, you have been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. So I want you to know, on the cross, what you're believing for has already been paid for. It's just in transit. It's in transit. Now, understand this. So yesterday, UPS showed up at my house, brought what had been ordered and paid for. Did you know that God uses the same delivery service? UPS. Here it is. Understanding patient's significance. I'm going to show you, this is a very powerful truth that you and I need to get down in our spirit. And here's why. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 11. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence, that word diligence means steadfastness or even aggressiveness. Okay, same diligence. And then he says this, to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you don't become sluggish. That word sluggish means slow to respond. And then notice this, but imitate those who through faith and, everybody say it, faith and patience. It's not a four-letter word, even though it's hard to say. I get it. The guy talking to you has to work on this as much as any of you. But he says here, I want you to inherit the promises You know, that thing you've been believing for. I want you to, but it comes through faith and patience. See, the faith thing is taught a lot, and it should be. It should be. Has some people perverted the faith message? Absolutely. But people pervert everything. But the faith message is important. Why? Because it's all through the scriptures. The just shall live by faith. Matter of fact, the Bible says he or she who cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So it's impossible to please God without faith. James, the Lord's brother, makes this statement. He said, if any of you lack wisdom, it could be lack healing, lack deliverance, lack joy, because all those things come from God. But he says, here's, he's particularly talking about wisdom. He said, if you lack wisdom, let them ask of God who gives to all liberally and holdeth, holdeth nothing back. It says this though, but... Let them ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts or does not come to God in prayer in faith, let not that man or woman expect to receive anything from the Lord. You know what they're saying? You can't transact with God without faith. See, understand something. God's not, God loves you. But God's not moved by your need. He's moved by your faith. If God was moved by need, there'd be no needs on planet Earth. See, on Earth, there's no shortage of needs, but there is a vast shortage of faith. And so I say it like this. Faith is kingdom currency. Just like the dollar is the currency in America. If I'm going to transact in America, i got to use dollars. If you're going to transact with God, you got to use faith. Now, here's the problem, though. We've stopped right there. We only went to one side of the coin. He says here, it's with faith and faith patience that we inherit the promises. See, we will not find the promise until we bind our faith with patience. So what's the word impatient mean? Now, when I read this definition of impatience, I know it's referring to your spouse, not you, but just listen anyway. Here it is. Restless or short of temper, especially under delay or opposition. Restless or short of temper, especially under delay or opposition. Question is, do you wait well? Do I wait well? What's so important about that? He says here, the the promise you're believing for hinges on that. Hinges on that. What's patience? The The capacity to accept or tolerate delay without getting angry or upset. How many God to help them? The promise you're waiting on hinges on that right there. The promise I'm waiting on, you know what he's saying? 
with faith and patience, we inherit the promise. When you learn, Bobby, when you learn to wait well, when you learn not to be so agitated and aggravated, and you learn how to be patient, that's when the promise will come. So, folks, listen, we're not waiting on God. He's waiting on us. You know what he's saying to us? Us? Usins? You know what he's saying? When you grow up, it'll show up. Until you grow up, it may not show up. And if it does, it's going to take it a long time. U.S., it just got stuck in customs. See, here's me. Very often when I'm waiting on a package, uh, does anybody track their Amazon packages when you order on Amazon? I do. I, where, where's it at? Kentucky? Why do you want to go through Kentucky? But I'll be tracking it, and there's three words I hate to see pop up. Delayed in transit. I hate those words. Now, it don't bother me when I look it up our, our Amazon order, and it says that about Jenny's. <laughs> she don't need it right now anyway. But when it's mine, hello. Do you know something, about folks? God will often not only allow, but he'll initiate divine delays in our lives. Not because he don't love us, but because he does. Listen to this. God is more interested in our development than in our demands. And often we're more interested in our demands than our development. So let's look at James 1. What's patience got to do with that? What's patience got to do with me developing? James 1 verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces what? So patience is not produced until you have to go through something. Patience is not produced when, until I have to go through something. But then when patience comes, I want you to know what patience produces. But let patience have its perfect work. See, God wants to do a perfect work in you. And God wants to do a perfect work in me. And the way he does it is through patience. And notice what happens after patience does its perfect work. That you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If you're honest, and if I'm honest, so many times we feel like something's lacking spiritually in our lives. Don't we? Just, is there something missing? And yeah, we should always grow in the Lord, but if we're on, there's just something missing in my spiritual life. I tend to think it might be patience. Here's why. Because we know that we lack nothing spiritually. I already shared the scripture with you. The Bible says in Christ, once you receive Christ, it says he blessed you with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. All means all. And then Peter says it, he's given you everything that pertains to life and godliness in Christ Jesus. So when we received Christ Jesus, we were given everything that pertains to life and godliness, and we were blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. So it can't be lack, it must be slack. Somewhere we're slacking. See, here's the truth. God develops what we need by making us wait for what we want. God develops what we need by making us wait for what we want. So, I'm not going to read the scriptures, guys. I'm going to hurry through this because they may not be patient with me. Uh, in Genesis 37, there's a very familiar story. And if you've not been in church before, you can just follow along with us. But if you have been in church, you know the story. But it's the story of Joseph. And so, Joseph is the second to youngest brother of, of uh, 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 his father, Je uh, Jacob, thank you. Uh, and so he's his brother, and uh, he's the younger brother, and God gives him a dream. It's a God dream. It's not some ambition he's just worked up. He has a dream from God. And his father, the Bible says, favored Joseph, and he made him a coat of many colors. And so, but Joseph had a, a problem. He was 17 when this dream comes. And you know what he does? He runs to his brothers and says, hey, first of all, check my coat out. Don't you wish daddy would give you one of them? Very cocky. 
And then he comes and tells him, says, I had this dream from God. And, and the dream was these sheaves were stood up, basically corn stalks, stood up. And he said, all of us had sheaves, but all of a sudden, all y'all sheaves bowed down to mine. Basically, he's saying, I want you to know that God's going to do something in my life, and y'all are all going to bow down to me. His brothers really didn't like that dream. And long story short, one day they're out in the field, and they got sick of this little smart mouth dreamer. They called him, here's the dreamer again. And so what they did is they jerked his coat off and threw him down in the pit. We're thinking about killing him. And they said, we'll put some animal blood on the coat and tell our dad that wild beasts killed him. But what happens is all of a sudden some Midianites come by and the brothers said, you know what? Let's get some money out of this little jerk. So they take him out of that pit and pull him up out of the pit and they sell him into slavery to a man named Potiphar. Potiphar is one of the captain guards of Pharaoh, which was the king. So Joseph then is taken as a slave down to Potiphar's house and what happens is uh, as he's in Potiphar's house, uh, Potiphar's wife tries to start seducing him and keeps coming on to him. And Joseph stays pure and he says, listen, I'm not sleeping with you. I'm not sinning against God. I'm not sinning against your husband. It's not going to happen. And finally, she kept on and on till one day she grabbed him and he ran away from her and she was able to grab his cloak. And when her husband comes home, she says, look what your slave tried to do to me. He tried to rape me. And so now Potiphar takes Joseph, throws him in the prison for something he didn't do. Joseph's having a few bad days. And so what happens is he's in prison, and then Pharaoh ends up being offended at, at, the, at the butler, his butler, and his baker, the chief baker. So Pharaoh takes the butler and the baker and the candlestick maker and, and throws them into prison. And now they're in, there in prison with Joseph. Well, what happens is they get a dream. And finally, they, Joseph sees them upset, and he said, what's wrong with you? Well, we both keep having these dreams. We don't know what they mean. So Joseph said, God will give you the interpretation. Let, tell me what the dreams are. And so they told him the dreams. Well, the first one, the baker, he tells him, he said, they're going to kill you. They're cutting your head off. <laughs> if I was the butler, I'd been running. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. But then he interprets the butler's dream and basically says, in three days, you're going to be restored. And you're going to be back in Pharaoh's house, handing him the cup. Now, here's what Joseph tells him. He says, when you get back to Pharaoh's house, please be kind and remember me. And tell Pharaoh I'm in this prison and that God allowed me to interpret your dream. That's all I ask. Just remember me. So, again, Baker's killed. Three days later, he's back in Pharaoh's house. You know what the butler does? Forgets all about Joseph. Forgets all about him. Hang with me. Two years later, two years later, the king has a dream. And he continues to have the recurring dream. He knew it was a dream from God for him and for the nation. But nobody could interpret it. And finally, you know what happened to the butler? Oh, Joe, that's right. Joe, I met Joe in prison. He interpreted mine in the back. And this is exactly what happened. You need to call Joe. Sure enough, they bring Joseph out of prison, bring him before Pharaoh. Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dream, sets, matter of fact, so interprets the dream and begins to counsel Pharaoh that it made the nation even wealthier. And Joseph gets promoted to vice president of the country. Now, here's the question, guys. He'd already been through the pit. He's already been through the prison. He's been in there for years. My question is this. If God wanted him out of the prison, and if the butler was going to forget about him three days later when he went to Pharaoh, why did God wait two years to give him the dream? Why did God wait? The butler forgot about him. He said, remember me when you go back in three days. It was two years later that the Lord gave him the dream. Why didn't God give him the dream on that first night that he was back? You know why? Because the divine delay wasn't over. Evidently, God still saw something in Joseph that needed to die or to grow. 
Are you with me? Listen. God develops us and he uses waiting to give us what we need, not just what we want. Here's the deal. The delay went over. Let me finish this story up. At 17, Joseph has a dream from God that he's going to be promoted to the palace. But it was 17 years later. He had to go through a pit and he had to go through a prison before he ever got to the palace. Why? Why did he have to go through those difficult delays? Because it was in the pit and in the prison that prepared Joseph with the patience for the palace. Listen, you take someone that gets a lot of power, but they have with that power impatience, that's somebody you really don't want to work for. I've seen it even among pastors. I have seen pastors when I have visited their churches. I mean just dominate and speak very mean to their staff. It's almost like the bigger the church gets, the more powerful they get and the more they treat their staff that way. You know what it is? They've got a lot of power with no patience. God didn't want Joseph to be that kind of leader. And so Joseph had to go through the pit and through the pit prison to have the patience when he got to the palace. Did it work? Well, let's look at it. Genesis chapter 42, verse 6. Since Joseph was governor of all of Egypt and in charge of selling grain to all the people, it was to him that his brothers came. Woo! That had been a meeting to sit back and watch, wasn't it? The brothers that threw him in the pit and sold him into slavery. And he had told them at 17, one day you're all going to bow before me. And so they tried to destroy him from that. And notice this. His brothers came when they arrived. They bowed before him with their faces to the ground. Sounds like the dream came true. But notice this. Why did it take 17 years? Here's why. Genesis 45, verse 4. Please come closer, he said to them, to his brothers. So they came closer, and he said again, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into slavery into Egypt. Please don't be upset, and don't be angry with yourselves for selling me to this place. Notice the next three words. It was who? It was who? It was God who sent me here. Notice this. He said, hey, guys, it was, it was God. See, God is not only the God of your promise. He's not only the God of the palace. He's God of the pit and the prison. He takes us through to take us to. And so Joseph said, it was God who sent me here. Why, Joseph? To preserve your lives See, at 17, the dream was all about him and about them bowing down. But because he learned patience through the pit and the prison, the dream was more about them than it was about him. See, when we grow up, what we're believing for will show up. But God knows when it's time. Does that make sense to everybody? Another example of this, and I was thinking about this. See, the Joseph at 17 who was so cocky and was bragging about all the power he was going to get, if he hadn't have learned through the pit and the prison patience, when his brothers showed up, they would have been patients in the local hospital. He'd have took them out. He wouldn't have focused on saving their lives. Another example of faith and patience is King David. You go back and look at the life of David. Starts out, David's the son of Jesse, one of uh, 12 sons, and he's the son of Jesse, and he's, uh, uh, he's the youngest of the brothers, and God tells Samuel, the prophet, I want you to go down to Jesse's house and anoint one of his sons is going to be king. So you know the story. Samuel goes down there. He says, I need to see your sons. And so he brings all of his sons before him except one. And as Samuel starts praying over all these big strapping, good looking young men, he gets done and he says, he's not here. And Samuel knew he didn't miss God. He said, do you have another son? And Jesse goes, well, there's David. He's out in the field with the sheep. Didn't even think enough of him to bring him in. And, and Samuel said, I'm not leaving until he comes in. Now, what you got to understand about shepherds is shepherds live with their sheep. It, it was a very menial job. 
It wasn't a glamorous job at all. Matter of fact, if you were a shepherd back then, you weren't even allowed to go into the temple because you were considered unclean and you didn't smell good. You'd been living out there with sheep. So it's a very menial job such that Jesse didn't even think to bring him in. And when he comes in, Samuel says, this is the one. And I want you to get, lean with me. He pours oil on David's head and anoints him to be king. Could you imagine that? You're a 15, 16-year-old boy, and you are now known as the next king of Israel. So where does David go from there? Back to the sheep for 15 years. 15 years. I want it now. 15 years he goes back out there and lives with those sheep, and you never see where David complained or tried to make anything happen. Matter of fact, they don't even recognize David, the people, until the war between Israel and the Philistines. And in that war, you know the story. There's this big giant named Goliath, and he's scaring all of the army of Israel. And one day, all David's brothers are at war. It says they had been trained as youth to be from youth to be warriors. And so Jesse tells David, he said, hey, your brother's up on the battlefield. Go take this pizza to him. So here's a pizza delivery boy. Now, how would you say pizza? Because it says it was bread and cheese. That's pizza, okay? <laughs> so, so, so David comes up. David comes up, and he's, he's got his pizza there. And when he walks up, he sees all of his brothers and the armies of Israel hiding behind rocks. And here's this giant cursing God. Cursing God and cursing Israel. And David goes, hey, what's up with this? Why is nobody taking him on? And his brothers get mad at that and said, shut up, you little punk. That's my interpretation. And go back to daddy's house. They told him, said, go back to be with daddy. You don't know nothing about war. And he says, I don't know about that. But I know this guy is cussing our God and cussing our nation. Hold this pizza. Hold my pizza. And through God's spirit, he destroys Goliath. And that's what gets him brought before Saul, the king. Saul takes a liking to David, brings him into his palace. David starts being one of his captains, one of his generals, and he defeats all the armies around. And what happens a few years into that, people start chanting David's name. And that ticks Saul off. Such to the point that he started trying to kill David. And one day, he and his men were chasing David and his men, and David was in a cave. Saul comes into the cave, and the Bible says he was so close to David that David took his knife and cut a little piece of Saul's robe off. Here's why he did that, to let Saul know, I'm not trying to hurt you. But his men said, hey, take him out. Kill him right now. And think about the temptation of that. He was anointed to be king, and the king is trying to kill him. You know what David said? No, I'm not going to try to make anything happen. How be it for me to touch God's anointing? When God's ready for me to do that, he'll be ready. Well, we need some of that, folks. See, here's the truth. Before God does something great through us, he wants to do something great in us. So many people, and I see young people in ministry doing this, and I get it, but they want to do something great. They want God to do something great through them, but they're not as passionate about God doing something great in them. And see, here's the problem. If God does something great through us before he does something great in us, then we get to thinking we're great. And we're not great. He's great. So during the waiting time, we must trust what God is doing. Have you ever had this happen? You get behind a slow driver. You usually got Alabama tags on it. Because <laughs> they're slow. Uh, just kidding. But got behind a slow driver and just start getting that, and it's one of them roads where you can't pass, and it's like, oh, my gosh. It's Tuesday, and you're doing a Sunday drive. Come on. But you know what? I've had that happen to me, and I feel that irritation coming up. But you know what I've had that happen before? And get down the road a few miles and see a horrible wreck. How do I know that wasn't a divine de delay ordained by God? See, I, I truly believe we're going to get to heaven sometimes and not realize how many times he saved our lives. See, what I, the point is this. God can see down the road. 
God can see down the road. When Jennifer and I came to this church, right before, about two years before this church, college ministry was doing great, hundreds of college students, one, one of the largest college ministries in the Southeast. And I say that because God's hand was on it, not because of me. But we've got this dynamic college ministry, and I'm feeling unsettled. I knew God was releasing me. I didn't know where he wanted me to go. I just knew where I wasn't supposed to be. That can be a dangerous time because it can get you to start getting out ahead of God. And so what happened was I just started getting more and more. And so I decided, you know what? I, I got to find a church. I believe God's wanting me to pastor. And so I'm going to find a church where I can teach the word of God to people. And so I, I located a church on the Alabama border. And uh, they had me and Jennifer to come in to preach. And I'll be honest with you, it looked good to the eye. Remember the, the fruit for Adam and Eve looked good to the eye? This church looked good to the eye. About four or 500 people. And uh, I remember when we, when we went down the road, this is year tw over 20 years ago, so this was a big deal back then, but they had this big, huge digital sign in the front yard, huge property. I think it's right, right, right around 60 acres of property. The building was beautiful. Uh, when, we, when we went in, they, they were sitting there waiting to, to greet us, and hey, we're so glad you're here, Pastor. I'm glad you came today. And So they said, before service starts, let's just take you through the building and show you the beautiful building. And then they said, we want to show you the office suite. Now, I got suites in my office, but it's not an office suite. My office is like, honestly, oversized closet. I'm not complaining because I don't like being in the office very much. So, but anyway, when they took me to the office suite, it was sweet. Marble floors, big, big old beautiful offices, and then the pastor's office was the corner suite, windows all the way around. I'm like, man, this is like the West Wing here. <laughs> Went and preached that service. The worship was awesome. The preaching was out of this world, but uh, no. <laughs> I preached for them. I preached for them. After the service, people kept coming up to me and Jen. Welcome home, Pastor. Welcome home, Pastor. Welcome home, Pastor. And so I'm, I'm all fired up. We're driving back. We pulled in the driveway and I asked Jennifer. I said, well, what do you think? She said, I want to kiss the driveway. I said, woman, when can you hear God? Because I was so excited about going to the church to pastor and to preach and teach God's word. Well, what happened is there was a pulpit pit committee and there was a board of directors. And so the pulpit committee had said, man, you're in. Man, the people just loved y'all being here today. You're in. About four or five days later, I get a call and said, you ain't in. I said, really? And I said, they do something wrong. No, it's just we're not going to go with you. Well, remember God can see down the road. See, there was internal fighting in that church between the elders and the board and the pulpit committee. And that church, I've been here 20 years now, that church has split at least three, if not four or five times because of all the fighting. There's more division than vision. I would have been right in the middle of all that. So what happens is, that was my impatience. What happens is I come back to Coopville. I'm in my college ministry office. Pastor Eddie is the district superintendent in Nashville. He calls me one day and said, what are you doing? I said, well, honestly, I was uh, on the internet uh, looking at churches. He said, what are you doing? He said, that ain't the one you way you find a wife or a church, boy. Get off that internet. I said, what do you mean? He said, Bobby. Go study your Bible, buddy. The will of God will always come find you. He said, when God wanted to appoint and anoint a man or a woman, he went and found them and said, come follow me. So I got off the phone, Pastor Eddie, got on my hands and knees, and I said, God, forgive me. I was trying to make this happen. Forgive me. Two weeks later, this church called. Two weeks later, Al Profunk called and said, hey, would you like to come pastor this church? Now, the honest answer to that was no. There was no people or no money. Why would I want to do that? You know what, though? You know what I can say to you 20 years later? Look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. I'm convinced that I would have messed everything up, but because I got out of impatience and I got impatient, I said, Lord, 
you know when the time is. You come touch me on the shoulder. And what I've been able to do is witness what God can do when we do it in and through him. See, impatience can destroy our lives. Abraham and Sarah, we talked about last week, because they got impatient. We have all these wars in the Middle East right now, and it goes back to them too. I'm not throwing stones. We all deal with it, but because God promised them a son, and because 25 years goes by, that's a long time, ain't it? You know, it tells me God ain't looking at his watch. They decided, well, we're going to make this happen. There's Hagar, Abe. Go be with her. And that birthed Ishmael. Impatience will birth an Ishmael and all the hell he brings. So we're all full of something while we're waiting. We're either full of thanks or complaints. I'm almost done. Be patient. The Israelites journey to the promised land. I'm going to tell you something. We can slow down God's delivery method. We can slow it down with our impatience. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Israel, deliverance from Egypt. Theologians will tell you that was a 12-day journey. It was supposed to take them 12 days to leave Egypt and enter into the promised land, which was Canaan. They were there for 40 years. They turned a 12-day journey into 40 years, and most of them died in the wilderness. So why did they turn a 12-day journey into 40 years? Here it is. 1 Corinthians 10, 10, nor complain, talking about Israel, as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now, all these happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of this age should come. You know what he's saying? God's saying, I had this written down so you won't do what they did. If you complain, you remain. You can't pout your way out of a divine delay. Now, I've had to run away. Thanksgiving is the voice of patience. Thanksgiving is the voice of patience. That's why all through the scriptures, when God tells us to pray, you know what he says? And pray with thanksgiving. Pray with thanksgiving. Pray with thanksgiving. Now, here's the problem for me and you. Thanksgiving is not natural. Now, we say somebody gives us something. Oh, thank you. He's talking about living in a state of thanksgiving, being thankful in your heart. It's so easy not to be thankful. It's, it's a spiritual exercise. It's intentional. It's kind of like physical exercise. How many would agree with me? Physical exercise is easy not to do. No. Would you agree with that? It's easy. Not, how many agree it's easier to sit on the couch than get on a treadmill? It's just easier. Which one brings the greatest results though? Couch brings two heart stents. There you go. Perfect illustration. But physical exercise brings great results, but it's got to be intentional. Listen, thanksgiving is not natural, but it'll bring supernatural results because it's the voice of patience. And with faith and patience, we inherit the promise. I Talk about physical exercise having such great results. I have a friend of mine I used to ride motorcycles with. He didn't ride much anymore, but this was back in his early to mid-60s. He was telling me one day, he said, you know what? He said, so I've been on insulin and blood pressure medicine. And he worked at a job where he sit most of the time. He didn't, there wasn't a lot of physical activity to it. He said, so I decided I didn't, I'm going to walk every, so every afternoon when he got home from work, he would go on a two-mile walk. And he did that every afternoon. Yes, he watched what he ate some, but he really started walking. Did you know in just a matter of months, he was able to come off insulin and blood pressure medicine? But it's easier to sit on the couch. That's why we sit on the couch. It's easier to complain than it is to give thanks. But we better start asking God to help us learn how to do that so we can start receiving the promises. Are you listening to me, folks? Now, I'm skipping this stuff. Uh, let me say this. God is wanting to work in us so he can work through us. And it, the truth is, guys, we get so focused on what we want God to do for us, but he's really focused on what he wants to do in us. And here's what I believe. If we'll stop, it's like I got convicted this week. Do you know what happens when I'm waiting 
whether it's on a, a package from Amazon or whether it's on something I'm needing God to do. You know what I'm guilty of doing? Watching my watch. But here's what the Lord convicted me of. You're watching your watch. He said, I'm watching you. He said, why don't you quit watching your watch and start watching me? And if you'll start watching me, watch and see what happens. And so I want to leave you with, it's with faith and patience we inherit the promises. So Pastor Bob, how does that work? We talked about love. I mean, we talked about peace in the last few months. We talked about the un indestructible, untouchable joy. And patience is just like those. It's a fruit of the Spirit. So patience is not something you're just going to decide to start doing this afternoon. Because that's dependent on your ability to bring it to pass. Patience is a fruit of the Spirit, just like love and joy. And so what's that mean? You don't work it up. You basically pray it in. And you say, God, help me to have patience. Help me because it's the faith and patience that brings your promises. So help me develop that Holy Spirit. And he will. He'll help you. Amen? Amen. Thank you for being patient with me today. Let me pray over you. Father, thank you for your people. Thank you, Lord, that you have big things in mind for us, big things in mind for them. Lord, I pray that, Lord, if they've been praying about things for years, that they won't give up, that they won't say, well, God's not interested or God doesn't let, but they'll realize that maybe, Lord, it's a divine delay. And maybe, Lord, if we'll heed to what you've said to us today and we'll grow up, some of these things will begin to show up. So help us, Lord. We want you to work in us. Now, head bowed and eyes closed. There is a kingdom benefit that comes with our salvation, guys. We've already mentioned it. The, the love, the peace, the joy, the, the, the patience, all these things that the world's craving, it only comes through God, and it comes through God through the Lord Jesus Christ. See, Jesus said, I am the way into the kingdom. And so if you don't know wherever you're at, right now you just feel the Lord speaking to you that you need the love of God, the peace of God. Maybe you're stressed right now. You need the joy of the Lord. You just got ongoing depression. Man can't fix those things, but God can. And if you say right now in your heart, I need Jesus to really work some things into and out of my life. And I know I'm not connected with him like I should be. Maybe you've never asked him for forgiveness, but maybe you have but you're just not close to him like you know you should be. I want to give you an opportunity. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. It's a prayer I prayed 30 years ago, but just to connect with Jesus on a deeper level. But if that's you and that resonates with you, no matter where you're at, I don't care if you're sitting at your house, if that's you and you say, man, I feel God moving in my life, would you raise your hand toward heaven? Say, that's me, that's me. Amen, 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 amen. Praise the Lord. Here's what I want to do. I want to give everybody an opportunity to talk to Jesus. And so if you would, everybody pray this with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for being patient with me. And Lord, I confess that you died for me and that God raised you from the dead. So I ask you to forgive me. Cleanse me with your blood. Be the Lord, the master and the king of my life, in Jesus' name, amen. We celebrate with you. You prayed that. We celebrate with you.